Thank you, thank you, not for just uh, being here, but for engaging and participating, whether you're a loud singer, soft singer, not a singer, just, just simply reading the words and allowing God to speak through you, it's completely okay. I love to, to kind of remind people that it's okay to, to worship in stillness, too, and we can't judge a book by its cover. Um, going, going back to um, where I'm from, my hometown, uh, this past week or so, I was reminded of my, my papa just sitting in the corner playing bass, and uh, you never lifted his hand, never really looked up, he just steady as he goes, he sat in his little chair, and uh, with his amp beside him, uh, just playing along, um, and I would, I would venture to say there's not many people with a straighter walk than he had in his life, and so, um, so it's okay to worship just sitting there. But, but there's sometimes, there's sometimes where his, um, his presence just overwhelms us and he stirs us and we have those goosebump moments and I pray that he visits you um, like he does me so often. So thank you, not just for being here, I say it again, but for participating and allowing the Spirit of God just to move. And, and I hope that you're comfortable. Uh, Jennifer and I talk about this a lot and we talk about our service and the flow and things of that nature. We want you to feel comfortable to be you here at New Hope Church and to worship as you feel comfortable. We are continuing our, our study throughout the, the summer. We're just calling it stories and we're kind of just walking through some popular stories, pulling out some of those uh, tidbits and hopefully pulling out some insights that maybe you grew up in Sunday school, you grew up in church, and maybe if you grew up in the flannel board days, right, you're kind of reminded of these stories, you can kind of see them on there. And you kind of go, did I miss something? There's something kind of neat kind of pulling out of that. And so appreciate Ryan uh, stepping in last week. He did a tremendous job. So thank you so much for, uh, it's great to know. You can kind of hand that baton off. And I appreciate Ryan so much for uh, putting so, uh, great of his, uh, so much of his heart uh, into this and the ministry here. And I appreciate him so much. Today we're going to talk about Daniel. And Daniel is such a big story. So we're going to kind of pull one part of it, in fact, where, where he interprets a dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. And so that's the part we're going to pull out. So let me just do a quick survey today, because I want to know who I'm dealing with, okay? So you don't have to raise your hand, because some of you are like, man, I will leave if you make me raise my hand. We're okay. All right, so, so we're good. After I just talked about pop in the corner, all right, so who would say that they are non-confrontational? And when I say non-confrontational, I mean like, you see a confrontation on the horizon, you bend and go the other way. All right, who would say that? See, these people, are, you're less apt to raise your hand, okay? <laughs> you're like, raising my hand seems confrontational, right? All right, because there's other people, right? So, so you know who you are. Those are those people. I'm this way by nature. I just don't, if there's a confrontation, man, I wanna, is there any way around this? And so then there's that other side where men... You love confrontation. Can you just own it today? It doesn't mean you're living in sin. All right? Can we just be okay with that? It's not sinful to confront. Anybody want to admit that you love a good confrontation? Some of you, we're going to talk afterwards because, you know, we confront all the time. All right? So, all right, so, so there's two different sides of the aisle many times. And it doesn't mean that you're just looking. If you're, if you're constantly looking for confrontation, there's something bigger that's a problem, okay? And we can't deal with that in this message today. But there's, there's those extremes, and that's what I want to kind of deal with today, just to set us up and, and kind of steer us in the right direction. There's two confrontational extremes. If you're taking notes, number one is this. Some are unwilling to confront. Now, this is the extreme. The ex extremes, we want to find, you know, kind of a happy medium here. And so on this side, what we say is, man, I just don't want to confront anything or anyone. I just want to pretend like everything's rosy. I just want to pretend like life is good. I want to just kind of cast my vote the way I want to vote. I want to pretend that everybody's getting along. If we're going on a car ride, I want to just assume that everybody's agreeing with where we're going. Everybody likes all the stops we're making. Everybody agrees with where we're staying when we get there. And you can live in that fantasy land all you want to, but the reality is there's different opinions, and there's going to be conflict in life. And somebody said, amen, there's going to be conflict. And so this extreme, this person, is someone who says, you know what, I just don't want to go there. And I never want to go there. I will do everything in my power not to confront anything or anyone. Let me just say, 
this is not a good place to be. It's not a good place to be where you're not willing to even confront what needs or who needs to be confronted at the right time. We'll deal with that. Number two, is some confront unlovingly. So you have this one extreme that they're like, man, I don't want to confront anyone or anything. I just want to live here. Nobody get in my lane. Let's just pretend. Okay, I'm just going to look away. I don't want to judge you. I don't want you to judge me. Let's just live in fantasy land. But there's that other extreme that says, all right, who can I confront today? <laughs> Whether it's through social media, behind, hide behind that phone or that computer, you know, just taking those passive aggressive jabs, or if it's just, man, you just need a good fight every once in a while. You know, just need to just kind of jab, pick a little bit. Let's get this thing going. I just need to get this off my chest. Whatever the case, you see yourself as the judge of the group. You see yourself as the police of the group, or you just... You just enjoy it for whatever sick reason, right? You just enjoy the confrontation. Those are two extremes, right? That extreme person that says, man, I'm just looking to confront somebody. I'm looking to pick a fight. I'm looking to this. I just love to stir it up, stand back and watch, right? If that's you, we'll talk later, okay? There'll be a special time. You may look at that extreme and you go, man, that is so bad, because look at the turmoil they're causing. Look at the problems they're causing. They're just stirring it up, throwing a rock, running away, watching it. Who's going to blame who for throwing a rock? But let me just say this. The other extreme, not dealing with it the right way, at the right time, for the right reasons, is just as bad as this. We've got to see that. We, so we, we can't ignore it just because we don't like it. We can't ignore it just because we want to, want to risk that relationship. So at some point, we've got to come to the middle because when we follow Christ, and you know this, if you've been following Him long enough, at some point in our following Christ, He's going to lead us to confront someone or something, but He's also going to lead someone to confront us about someone or something. And you know it. If you've been following Jesus long enough, you understand what I'm saying. And so what I want to talk about today is let's, let's remove the extremes, the, the complete passivity of I don't want to confront anybody or the complete just aggression of, man, I'm just looking for somebody to confront. I want to find fault in everything, every group. I just want to find fault. And I feel like I'm the person that has to call it out. So let's, let's find some common ground, because I want us to seek wisdom. And if we're looking for a goal today, we're seeking wisdom to confront the right way, at the right time, and for the right reasons. So what could those be? It could be in your marriage. It could be if you're married, you say, well, I just, there's something that's just not right. They're bothering me. There's just these little things, or it could be a big thing. You've just been putting it off and putting it off. Or on your other side, where I've just been nagging, 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 and just, you know, there's just, now you're not dealing with the main issue. You're just finding fault every time they do something. And so it's time for you to just sit down and confront the source of the problem. Let's find the source. Or it could be a child where you're just like, man, they're, they're making some poor decisions right now. How do I lovingly correct them? How do I just sit down and have a real conversation, depending on their personality, depending on their age? How do I do this? Or something's happened. There's tragedy. There's, there's bad news. And so how do you confront that? How do you bring up that conversation? And how do you deal with it? Maybe you have an accountability partner and you have promised them, they've promised you to call you out in love. And you've heard about something, you're picking up on something, and it's time for you to just speak up. Whatever that is, I've been praying all this time is that the Holy Spirit would just reveal to you, reveal to me, what is that thing that may be hindering a relationship that I have? It could be a relationship with Him, it could be a relationship with them. That maybe there's something that's going on within me, or there's something I'm not seeing, there's a blind spot, because we all have them. And this is where we kind of get into the story. King Nebuchadnezzar, just because it's easier, we're going to call him King Neb. Is that okay? Is that offensive to you? Okay. All right. So King Neb was an evil king. In fact, if you believed in reincarnation, and I don't, but let's just say Saddam, Saddam Hussein would have been kind of similar to somebody modern day. You think about this, just the, the atrocities this guy did. He was just super evil. 
Um, King, and Daniel served under him. He was one of his trusted advisors, uh, dream interpreters. He had served with him for many, many years. And God was trying to reach King Neb because he's trying to reach everybody, even the ones that are super far away. And so the king had this dream, and it just rattled him. And he reached out to all of his interpreters because he had so many, and no one would either you know, interpret it because they couldn't, or what I believe is they wouldn't. Because when we kind of walk through the dream, you kind of, kind of pick through, okay, well, this kind of makes sense. It kind of connects here. And so all the interpreters, none of them would interpret the dream and what it meant. And so he calls Daniel to him. At this point in Daniel's life, he would have been about 45 or 50 years old, so he's a middle-life guy. He's been working, he's been earning trust of the king, he's been kind of climbing the ladder, if you want to look at it that way, and he's kind of placed himself in this position where he's a trusted advisor, and when no one else could interpret the dreams, Daniel was the one who's brought in because he's the most trusted. So the king brings him in, and then he explains the dream that he had. He said there was a large tree in the middle of the earth. It, was, it grew tall and strong, reaching to the heavens. It provided fruit and shade, and the whole world benefited from this tree. Birds were nesting in its branches, and animals kind of hanging out in the shade. But the Holy One from heaven said, I'm going to scatter the fruit, and then I'm going to chase the animals from the shade. I'm going to cut it down, but I'm going to leave the stump in the ground. So everyone will know that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of this world. And so at that point, Daniel hears the dream. He kind of just began to process it. Obviously, he's a man of prayer. He's close to God. He's intimate with God. So he's seeking kind of, God, show me what this means. And at this point, he understands what's happening. But he doesn't really want to go there. Can we just be real about it? Because Daniel was a real man. This isn't necessarily making assumptions. It's just kind of putting ourselves in the place. Understand that King Neb summoned him. Daniel didn't go looking for trouble. Just like he didn't go looking for trouble when he was thrown the lion's den. He just simply did what he did every day. Pray three times a day at the same spot. He just didn't go out picking a fight. But when the fight came to him, you know what he did? He stood up and he stood out. He didn't want to interpret a dream, but you know what he said? This is what I've got to do. Now, just to lighten it up, because we're going to get some, some deeper stuff, let, let's kind of have some fun with meanings of dreams. You ever wonder what your dreams mean sometimes? Okay, let's kind of go through. Anybody ever dreamed that you were falling? Anybody been falling in your dream? That means that something in your life you're going through you can't control, right? All right, so forgetting the exam, even when you're not in school. How many, when you're after school is over, you still had, I forgot the exam. Anybody? Is that just me? Okay. Woke up in the middle of the night one time. I was like, I am out of school. But I was dreaming that I was in school. They gave out this test. And I didn't know what I was doing any test, even if I prepared for it. But this one especially. And I'm like, what in the world? So I found out that it means that I don't feel prepared, which is often the case. Anybody ever dream of chocolate, ladies? That means you feel like you deserve to be rewarded. <laughs> All right. So... That's when we gave you all chocolate on Mother's Day, right? So anybody ever have, to have, have the dream where you have to go to the bathroom? Anybody? You know what that means? Guys, it means you better get up and go to the bathroom. That's what that means, okay? Just in case, all right, just in case. All right, so, so let's kind of get into the story. Um, Daniel is, is interpreting the dream now, and so he, he addresses the king in Daniel chapter 4, verse 22. He says, your majesty, and I love this where he, he understands his position. It doesn't mean that he was worshiping the king. It means that he understood his position on earth. He still served God, the, the, the true, one true king, but he understood his place. And so there's, there's nothing wrong with us paying homage and paying respect to the people over us, even though we don't agree with them. And so I love that. He says, your majesty, you are that tree. He just goes right in. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky, and your domi uh, dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. So he said, okay, you're that tree, bottom line. That's you. You've grown up. You're a great king. You have just tremendous wealth, tremendous influence, tremendous uh, reach as far as your kingdom goes. And then he goes a little further, 25 and 26. 
You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times, which means seven years, will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. In verse 26, the command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when, that's emphasis on that, when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Is that good news or bad news, guys? That does not sound like good news to me. What is he saying? You're like, is we making this stuff up? It's really cool. He, he's basically saying that this guy's going to go insane because he's been so filled with pride. He's been leading, taking his position that God placed him in, and he's just been abusing it. He's been using it all the wrong way. And so God's been trying to reach him through the influence of Daniel. He's continued to be filled with pride. And so he says, okay, I'm done. I'm going to strike you down and all of your people down, and I'm going to put you out in the woods. You're going to go insane, and you're going to think that you're a wild animal. This guy who's king, he's leader, he's, he's just the head of everything, and all of a sudden, for seven years, what is he going to be doing? He's going to be hanging out in the woods. He's going to be eating grass. Why? Because he thinks he's a wild animal. Whew. Can I just say here, don't mess with God? <laughs> Can we just say that real quick? Okay, so Daniel could have stopped there. He could have said, you know what? I interpreted the dream. I'm out. That's what it means, because this was not good news. But the thing about Daniel, he understood that, okay, God has given me this platform. He's given me this opportunity. He's given me the trust between me and the king. So I, I've interpreted it for him, but you know what? The ultimate goal, like any relationship, is to not just reach them toward God, but it's also to keep them with God in their relationship. And so when we have an opportunity to confront someone in love, even though if it's, if it's bad news and we're risking the relationship, and for Daniel, he's really risking his life and all the trust that he's built over all these decades. He's risking everything, not just to interpret what he did, but then he goes a step further and he says, you know what, I'm going to seek restoration here. I, I've got this opportunity. It, it's not going to be given to me ever again. And so how am I going to use this opportunity? God puts the people in our lives for the reason of them knowing God and them sharing biblical community. Understand that. The people in our lives are there for a reason. And we need to trust those relationships. We need to trust the opportunities that are given to us and be willing to risk the relationship if it's the right time and it's what God is leading us to do. So he goes a little further in verse 27. He says, King Neb, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what is right. Do you think that King Nebuchadnezzar is like, yeah, give me more of that? Anybody? Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. There's so much in here. There's a couple of things I want to pull out that aren't in your notes. You can just jot them down if you want to. But just because King Nebuchadnezzar was prospering, did that mean that God was blessing him? No. So you look around and you go, well, why isn't God blessing me? Why isn't him? I'm not saying that everybody who's, who's blessed is bad. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, we can't just look on the outside because everything seems to be perfect, everything seems to be going their way, and be like, God has got his hand. No, no, no. King Nebuchadnezzar was running as far away from God as he possibly could, but he had everything, at least in worldly terms. He had the power, he had the prestige, he had the possessions, he had everything. But in a moment, God said, let me take that back. You are not defined by what you have. The world is not defined by what they have. You are not defi defined by the friend group that you have. And the friend group that you want to be part of, that you maybe not be part of, they're not defined by that either. You are defined by who God says you are. You are defined by your relationship with Him and the health of the relationships that God has placed around you. And why can't we just be content to say, God has blessed me. This life that I have is the blessed life. Can I be okay with that? 
before we kind of move on to what we want to kind of deal with, the confrontation, because if God is leading us to confront, and sometimes he may lead someone to confront us, what does that look like? A couple questions I want to throw out there to you. Is there someone you need to lovingly confront? Is there someone in your life that you love dearly? You've heard something. You've seen something. You just kind of, you, you're around them enough because God's placed that relationship in your life. Let me just add this. God is not going to call us to confront someone we don't have a relationship with. Can I just say that? A stranger at Walmart shows up when Walmart opens back up again. A stranger at Walmart shows up and says, Brian, here's what needs to happen. <laughs> you know what? I'm not receiving that a whole lot, right? But, but someone I know, someone I love, someone I trust comes to me, it's, it's a whole lot better. So, so first thing we need to understand is that the king had a relationship with Daniel. Daniel had a relationship with the king. That's why he could say those things and risk it. So is there someone in your life that God is leading you to lovingly confront about something? You, you see the way they're spending their resources, and you say, man, I, let, let's talk about this. Because if you keep going down this path, you're gonna, there's a relationship issue. You see the way they're acting in public and it's different things. You know, they're being passive-aggressive, and you say, man, I've been on that. Tr I just, hey, watch what you say. Is there something that you feel like, man, God is leading you, and you're kind of resisting, but you know God is leading you? But on the other side of that, that that's when, when God is leading us to do the confronting. But what about when God may be leading someone else to confront us? So the question here is, is, is my heart prepared to receive loving criticism? Am I living in such a way, am I close enough to God that if someone were to come to me today and say, hey, I want to talk to you. Don't you love hearing that? <laughs> we need to talk. When they do that, what is our first reaction? I'm a pastor, and I'll just own it. I mean, when, if somebody comes to me, you know, whoever it is, comes to me, hey, we need to talk. I, my first reaction is, I want to get on guard. I'm like, it wasn't me, right? <laughs> no way. We, we want to get defensive. But, but are we really going to be open if someone were to be led by God to come and talk to us and have a real conversation? Are we at least open to what they have to say? Prayerful confrontation. Let's look at Galatians 6.1. Dear brothers and sisters, Paul writes, if another believer, so we're talking about people within the community that we have relationships with, is overcome by some sin, you who are godly, that doesn't mean you're better, it means that you're godly, should gently and humbly, and then let me just kind of add this, I'm not adding to scripture, I'm just kind of reinforcing this, not arrogantly and harshly, can we just throw that in? Help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall in the same temptation yourself. So let's kind of walk through two parts of this. Again, if you're back to your notes again. Number one, God help me confront with the goal of restoration. So if we're, we're kind of just, okay, God is leading me to confront someone about something. So I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what I'm supposed to say. I'm just trying to pick the right time, the right place, and because I know the right reason, all of that. How do I do it? Well, he points it out in, in this part of the scripture, Galatians 6, 1 again. Gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. I want you to get this. The goal is not being right. The goal is helping others get right with God. Gotta be, I'm going to let that sink in. This Paul's is intentional. When God leads us to confront someone in love about a sin, about a blind spot, about something that we feel like, man, I, if they don't fix this, it, it could be a disaster down the road. We are not to come in with guns blazing over here with this extreme of, man, I'm looking, God gave me a pistol and I'm ready to fire. There's my target. Nor do I do the other extreme where I'm over here and going, I know God's leading me to confront them. I know God's leading me to do this. I, I wish somebody had said that to me years ago. But you know what? I just don't want to ruin our relationship. I don't want to miss. It's such a good thing. Well, what if it's such a good thing because God has been orchestrating this whole time because He is sovereign and He is, he is just amazing. 
He's been paving the way for you to be the right vessel and the right voice and the right instrument at this time to prevent something tragic in their life. I was was a youth pastor back at my home church in Georgia, and I was there for, I don't know, three or four months. And I I was hired with the understanding, at least this is me, and so you want to talk about miscommunication on both sides, I would say that would be the case. But I came in, and I thought, okay, well, I'm over the teenagers, right? That's what I'm supposed to be doing. And so I'm playing these events. I'm leading Wednesday night deal, and we're just blowing and going, and we're seem like things are going well. Well, then I, you know, if you've been around church you know, long enough, you understand conversations. You see people talking. You're like, are they talking about me? Well, this time they were. It was a dad of one of the, the kids, the children, was talking to the pastor. And it's had that inkling, you know, it's like they're talking, and they're talking about me. And they were. So the next day, show up to the office. Brother Pet, my pastor at the time, called me in the office. Said, "Hey, we need to talk. We need to, you know, this and that. I think, I think you need to plan some more things for the younger kids." And I was like, "Well, I, I'm the youth pastor, right? This is what I'm supposed to." No, no, no. You're, you're, you're the everything pastor. You're, you're over all of them from graduation down to the nursery. That's what you're hired to do. And I was like, "I," and I had that like, "Are you what?" You know, I wanted to push back. I want to resist. But let me just say, I, and it's only because of God's strength at that point. Because as I was kind of pushing back and resistant, going, well, that, that's not my understanding. All of a sudden, I feel like the Spirit of God said, no, no, you need to kind of back off. You need to just, okay, just, just do it. Let me, let me just say, there was a lot of things working in that. But what was happening is, I could have very easily kind of push back and resist it and say, you know what, that's not my job. Everybody been there? That's not my job. But I believe because he, he confronted me in love and came at the right way without bringing this dad in who didn't have the right spirit at the time. We ended up being really close in the end. But, but at that time, it was about a lot of negativity and about a lot of complaining. But in the end, what began to happen was this ministry began to turn into what we called a junior church on Sunday mornings. We'd have 60 kids from the age 6 to 12 in there. And we're just reaching kids for Christ. And these are, this is one of my favorite ministries and all the time I've been in ministry. And it wouldn't have happened if a guy hadn't have maybe done it the wrong way, but either way, he did that, but then my pastor handled it the right way and brought me into this thing, and it began to turn into something that I really consider special. I say all that to say that it's not anything major, it's not anything sinful, but, and, and it doesn't have to be. When God is calling us to confront someone about something or something about someone, it, it doesn't have to be sinful, it doesn't have to be anything major, it could be just, I just need to confront you because this was said and I think you need to know about it. Isn't that what relationships are all about? Is what that loyalty is all about. So, am I open to what God is calling me to do with the goal of res- restoration? Number two, and then finally, God helped me confront with caution. God helped me confront with caution. Paul also points out, out, and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Now, what what he's not saying, and what he is a couple of things that are kind of working here. You may think that, well, if I'm confronting someone about a marital issue or I'm confronting someone with a, a drinking issue or a drug issue, if I'm confronting someone who's, who's gone too far, then what he's saying is I don't want to go all in and, and get in that environment because I may be tempted to fall in there too. That, that's a part of it. But what, what I think is happening is he's saying that it's not the thing to fall into, it's pride. Because when we confront someone, when God is calling us to confront someone in love and bring them out of sin or bring them, keep them from a mistake or the wrong path, what he's really calling us to do is step in and be in place of authority of some way to come in and say, hey, I'm here to help you. And so if we don't approach it the right way, we're going to walk into that situation, we're going to walk into their life, we're going to walk into that pit and we're going we're to kind of come across as, I'm better than you. And I'm here to rescue you. That's what he's talking about. When God leads us to confront someone, he wants us to step in there just like he stepped into our life. In a loving, merciful, gracious way. 
to simply say, I'm here to help. I'm not here to judge. I'm here to call it what it is, but I'm here so we can get out of this. Now, in, in my years of ministry, not just here, but in other churches, God, God is, has, has brought a lot of different circumstances, a lot of different things. And it, and it all boils down to there's, there's, there's three things that are happening. It, it's the lust of the flesh. It's the pride of life. Right? It's the lust of the flesh. Pride of life. And there's a third one. My brain is going flat. <laughs> Eyes. Thank you. It's all about greed. Don't y'all love when I can just be real? I, it's embarrassing to me, and somebody can confront me later, right? <laughs> just confront me on the way out. I'm, I'm good. I'm broken now. Here we go. But it, it all comes down to I want more stuff, or I want a better position or better status, or I want that person. That's what it all boils down to. Everything that we're tempted to do. It, it can be filled in those categories. And so when you're, when you're stepping into someone's life, when you're stepping into their, their space, just understand this. They don't want you there. They don't want you there. They don't want you confronting them. But God wants you to reach them. God wants you to protect them. It doesn't mean they're going to get on the right path because I've had instances where I've confronted people in love and I felt like it was the right time, the right place, the right reasons, everything. And they said, you know what? I get it and I'm still going my way. And you've done your part. But what I, I want you to understand is at some point we're going we're to be responsible for the opportunities and the relationships we have. And part of the being part of the community is not just the benefit of the good stuff but it's also the benefit of the uncomfortable stuff. I'm thankful that there have been people who love me enough along the way that have approached me and said, hey, we need to talk. What is God leading you to confront? Maybe not in someone right now, but what is God leading you to confront in yourself right now? And are we open to someone having that conversation or are we just going to be resistant? I love knowing that we're in a community that loves God and loves one another. But if we're not doing what Paul is writing about, if we're not lovingly confronting, if we're not having those conversations with the goal of restoration, then there's no other way to say it except that we're failing. We're failing. And so as we pray, as we close out, I want you to just open up your heart. I want you to just invite God to show you. Not only is it just quit looking at someone else right now. God's going to show you. But I want you to first of all look within. Is there something within me that a spirit is wanting to confront in me? And then begin to look out. Is there someone in my life that God's wanting me to confront in a loving way? And then ask God to prepare your heart for when it's time for someone to confront you. Will you bow your heads with me? God, I thank you so much for your love, for your mercy, for your grace. I thank you that at Georgia camp, when I was 12 years old, that your spirit confronted me in that pew. You confronted me and you made me aware that I was sinful, that I needed you as my Savior. I thank you along the way your Holy Spirit has confronted me many, many times about a variety of things in my life that you're wanting to change, you're wanting to transform, you're wanting to remove, you're wanting to add. Whether it's my attitude, whether it's my behavior, whether it's my motives, whatever the case may be, I thank you that you have been a loving counselor and confronter within me. 
I thank you for the people in my life. I thank you for the people who have loved me enough to be honest with me. And so God, I pray that you help us to allow you to confront us today. Thank you that that you love us enough that you want us to be better. You want us to be better wives. You want us to be better husbands. To be better fathers and mothers and friends and followers of you. Because if someone sees it, then there's others that see it. So help us to love people enough to have those conversations. And then just prepare our hearts. Hopefully we're softened enough we're, for others to speak into our life without being defensive, without being argumentative, that we would just listen and then allow you to take it from there. If there's someone here today as we're talking and working through this, the Holy Spirit has just simply made you aware that you have yet to confess your sins to Him and invite Him into your life. And that's where it begins. So if that's the decision you want to make today, I'd love to lead you in a prayer. Anyone here today just want to invite Jesus into your life, ask Him for forgiveness, seek life in Him.